bleep went off, major incident declared, major incident declared, and I looked at the bleep and I thought, this is it. And we got there on the Friday and literally things were just being built all around us and we were ready to start Saturday at two o'clock and that was just phenomenal. I've never seen anything move so quickly. We've got the facilities now which meet the needs of being able to identify people in the event of a mass disaster or tragedy on behalf of their loved ones. We know that if we have a mass disaster, we can manage the numbers, we can manage them with respect and with safety for the staff working. On the 7th of July 2005, terrorists detonated four bombs in the centre of London. Phil Allen was just finishing his night shift at St James Hospital in Leeds, where he works as a radiographer. Got home about just before nine o'clock in the morning, turned the TV on, and obviously at that time it was full of um, what was going on in London, which was a little bit confused at that time, but it was becoming obvious that some mass disaster had occurred. London under attack. 33 confirmed dead as terrorists target... London. I pretty well decided that if, if we were going to be needed, uh, then I should make my services available. Uh, it's already packed a bag uh, in preparation. Some people had rung up and said you know, something going on was a power cut and we started to look on the internet and couldn't get much information. It was all a bit... You know, it was a power cut, uh, there was a fire or something like that. Then the major incident bleep went off. We are all trained to run a major incident policy. Um, but we'd never actually used it, we only practised it. Um, bleep went off, major incident declared, major incident declared. And I looked at the bleep and I thought, I showed it to my other colleague and said, this is it. Within three hours of the first explosion, as the city reeled from the impact of the four bombs, the decision was taken to activate the London Mass Fatality Plan. For the plan to succeed, it would be necessary to bring together a group of specialists, including coroners, pathologists and other forensic support. Among them, the volunteers of the UK Forensic Radiography Response Team. It was becoming apparent that the existing mortuaries in London might not be able to cope with the numbers of victims of the four bombs. A key element of the plan was the construction of an emergency mortuary in the grounds of the Honourable Artillery Company on City Road. Um, so we actually walked into the mortuary, but there was very little. It was just a shell when we first started, when we first got there. And I think that's one of the most phenomenal experiences I think I've ever experienced, is actually watching the mortuary build being built all the way around you and it was that fast um, and we got there on the Friday and literally things were just being built all around us and we were ready to start Saturday at two o'clock and that was just phenomenal. I've never seen anything move so quickly. It was a remarkable logistical achievement. Overnight, in just a few hours, contractors assembled one of the largest mortuaries in the world. Later, the Lord Chancellor was to describe these facilities as setting the gold standard for victim care and the pursuit of forensic science. Teamwork was at the heart of this remarkable operation. Volunteer radiographers, more used to working with hospital patients, now found themselves working on the dead alongside the forensic pathologists. We had pathologists at our shoulders saying, well, what's that and what's this? Say, well, that was a clavicle or that was um, a foreign body or something like that. And, and they could take that information away. I learnt that radiography was absolutely key. History shows that a huge proportion of identifications are done uh, on dental evidence, which needs the radiography, uh, or are done by other means that, that radiographers are involved in. They're a safety aid to those who are actually doing the examination. They're provi providing fundamental information. You could not do this without the radiographers. At the end of the day, especially for 7-7, there were families waiting outside, desperate, to find out who their loved ones were. So I feel that that was an enormously empowering and rewarding thing to be able to take my skills from the NHS setting into working with the deceased to get victim identification. Following the success of the temporary London mortuary, the Association of Forensic Radiographers was invited, with others, to put forward its ideas for the design and planning of a national emergency mortuary to be known as NEMA. In the autumn of 2008, Members got their first opportunity to see inside this new facility. 
The groups working in NEMA have to work together as a united team. That's the only way we can cope and manage the situation that's presented to us. But the working links between the pathologists and the radiographers is a particularly important one because the radiographers give us some very special information particularly in terrorist situations where we do far more radiography, the scanning, the looking for the fragments of bombs, the wire and the other material. But they're also very, very important in, in inverted commas, ordinary mass disasters, where we're looking for fragments of bones, old bony injuries, and of course, working with the odontologists as well in terms of identification. The relationship between the pathologist and the radiographer is critical. As the bodies arrive at the mortuary, the radiographer conducts the first scan. So the first stage for us is an initial scan or, or screening without opening the body bag. And at that stage, you're looking for really um, anything that may be hazardous uh, for the pathologists or technicians who are opening the, the bag and going to be examining the remains. You're looking for any identifying features, uh, for example, in terms of previous fractures or perhaps uh, pins and plates that have been put in uh, during operations. But you're also looking for uh, personal effects and for example small personal effects for example earrings or, or necklaces and that sort of thing which it, you may immediately think well you can see those but quite often if you have bodies specifically ones that have been in fires for example in aircraft, aircraft crashes you won't see that information whereas you will on x-ray so you're charting all of that so that when the pathologist comes to do the external examination they've got an indication of what is in there they can see if there's anything hazardous and they know where to target their investigation to start with. We're all in this because we want to provide a very professional and caring service to victims' families in the event of the worst case scenario. And we cannot afford to get that identification wrong. We've got to make sure that we provide that service which makes sure that the identification is absolutely right. And that's where there's some frustrations about how long the process takes. I don't apologise for that because it's more important to get it right than do it quickly. And what we've got here with the NEMA setup is that they've listened to everything that's needed by all the pathologists, all the odontologists, all the police officers that are involved in this service and actually come up with this, which is phenomenal. The expertise of the UK Forensic Radiography Response Team is recognised around the world. Its volunteer members helped identify victims of the Asian tsunami in 2004. Um, DNA proved problematic because of the time taken to get samples and also the degeneration of the um, remains made it very difficult as well. And dental came into its own in the Asian tsunami in particular. Others have assisted humanitarian crises in Bosnia, Kosovo, Sierra Leone, Cyprus, Iraq and Sri Lanka. But as well as victim identification, they have a secondary role, which may help prevent future loss of life. Specifically in, in, in aircraft crashes, for example, or transport crashes of any, any nature, is why the incident happened and what was the nature of the injuries that were caused. And can there be any design changes made, for example, to an aircraft uh, or indeed to protective equipment? Uh, that could actually prevent those injuries being caused. And sometimes it's necessary to do a very detailed examination uh, of uh, the trauma patterns that uh, are sustained you know, by an individual to find out exactly the nature of those and how they were caused and why they were caused. So radiology can be useful in a lot of, a lot of ways, some of which are very important and, if you like, up front and around the identification, and others come perhaps a little bit later and are more research orientated around the changes that can be made to preventing such incidents happening in the future. Since the London bombings, the Association of Forensic Radiographers have continued to recruit suitably qualified members and train them to cope with a disaster that we hope will never take place. After 7-7, the London Assembly described the emergency mortuary as a remarkable achievement. The correct identification of the deceased was a highly complex and sensitive task which was completed within just seven days. Many would say that the success of the operation was due in no small measure to the work of the volunteer radiographers. Isn't it great that we've got a team of, of radiographers who are prepared in their own time to train for this sort of work and have, over a number of years, years nurtured 
uh, a scheme that we can now have people who are willing and capable and qualified to walk into a mortuary and do this work. The UK Forensic Radiography Response Team and the International Association of Forensic Radiographers are always looking for new members. If you're a radiographer and would like to be considered, or if you're involved in emergency planning or part of UK Resilience and would like to know more about the work of the team, visit their website for more information, afr.org.uk.